I'm ready. Yes, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. There's money to be made disrupting boring markets. Welcome to Clarity Practice Management. I'm Frank Stitely, the CEO and co-founder of Clarity. I'm also the managing partner of a CPA firm. The number one problem for CPAs and accountants is that they can't achieve enough leverage in a commoditizing market to be profitable. Clarity lets accountants do what they do best, which is serve clients and outsource the rest to us. Patty Partner is an average CPA firm owner, and there are three groups of people she has to delight and serve, new clients, current clients, and family. Standing between her and being able to do that is a practice management monster that starts out with poorly integrated technology, staff management headaches, problems with security, and ends with poor communication systems and the inability to work remotely, which has all of a sudden become a little bit important over the last year. <laughs> we create a happier patty partner by providing practice management as a service, which consists of remote office technology, deeply integrated software tools, better workflow design and project management. We help her automate routine admin tasks. We can also provide staffing and admin support as well as marketing support. This is how we, ha how we help Patty partner financially. If she has a million dollar firm before Clarity, she can expect to be making about $200,000 a year. With Clarity, we believe we can more than double her bottom line with practice management as a service and practice management as a platform. Clarity practice management has two pieces to it. Practice management as a platform, which is the software behind Clarity practice management. There are two pieces to that. Clarity, the app, which exists today. It is workflow management, client and staff collaboration and RPA all in the cloud. And with integration partners, we will provide a full suite of back office software. And we'll do that by providing standardized virtual workstations that we can roll out very quickly. Practice management as a service is outsourced back office for Patty Partner and other accounting firms. We'll help her with process improvement. We'll help her with outsourced accounting, staffing, admin support, and even with marketing. We have a partnership with a major international accounting software firm that gives us nearly instant access to the roughly 300,000 accounting firms around the world. You can see our projected market penetration in the US only through 2026. And the point of that is to say, we don't need to have a really high percentage of the market to make a lot of money. We have three firms that we expect are gonna be our main competition. None of them are doing practice management as a service. Walters Kluwer and Thomson Reuters are big in the accounting and CPA world. They are primarily software only and they're very expensive and don't play well in the sandbox with anybody else's apps. And there's also Intuit who probably everyone is familiar with QuickBooks. They're not accountant centric. To put together a back office, you've got a mishmash of apps that don't work well together, and they have a horrible reputation for support in the accounting software industry. Here's our traction through July. We have 140 plus firms in three in free 30-day trials. Right now, we have more like 40 firms in paid plans, and we're generating more than 100 leads a week. And this is just for the Clarity standalone application that exists today. These are our financial projections. We expect to break even cash flow wise by about 2023 on a revenue of about 6 million. We are acquiring customers through a focus on content marketing and establishing ourselves as experts in practice management. We generate leads and then we work them through our funnel and hopefully they become customers at the end of it. We also have a lot of top industry influencers who are on our side and working with us. We'll also be doing joint and cross promotions with our vendor partners, the most important of which is in the upper left, the international accounting software company. We're under an NDA right now. 30 seconds. And we expect to make an announcement in the first week of next year. Our roadmap isn't just accounting. We also will expand to the legal profession, engineering and architecture, places that have similar business models and poor leverage. This is our team. I'm a co-founder. Peter Daniel owns a software firm, and he is also a co-founder. 
Richard is our marketing person. We're asking for $2 million for 30% equity, and we're open to safes and other arrangements. This is to be used for primarily for development and to scale marketing. All right. So I, do I jump in now, JJ, for questions? Is that right? Okay. Yes. Um, so in the introduction to our... Uh, yeah, well, we should have done it before. Maybe we'll do it after this is done because okay. we, we were late we need to get maybe moving. in between the two companies. Yeah. All right. So I already have one hand raised. Robert Stacy. Frank, uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I uh, like what I saw so far. So I have one question. Could you um, give us some color on the sales cycle time and the conversion rate from your prospect to a paid customer? Okay, uh, the sales cycle time is typically somewhere around 30 days. Uh, we're generating, and the way it works is that typically somebody sees a webinar or some content that we've done, we invite them into a webinar. And then if it's a bigger firm, we may have an individual demo as well. The Right now, what we're doing, we, we have close to 50 people that are 50 firms that we've gotten and we've had approximately 300 uh, free trial. So that I think gives you an idea of our conversion once we've gotten them to the trial stage. Thank you, Frank. All right, we got Garrett Brown. Hi, Frank. On one of the slides, I think you talked about your existing suite and then you talked about using integration partners to get yes. the rest of the product lines in there. Can you talk a little bit more about that process, what that's going to look like for you? Are you going to be agnostic? Are, you, are, are your customers going to have to use specific products or can you integrate with whatever they already have? We are going to create literally virtual workstations that we can roll out and it is going to be our suite, but there will be some choices within it. Uh, the international accounting software company has a big suite that has time and billing, CRM, subscription management, uh, but we will be giving people, for instance, choices in tax prep, depending on the size of the firm, because obviously not one size fits all. But for the most part, it's going to be a limited selection so that we can roll them out fast and we know what they are for support purposes. All right. Then we have John. Sorry, John Har Harbison. John? We can't hear you, John. You're on mute. Hi. On one of your earlier slides, you had a proposed P&L, which talked about how much Patty was going to save by using your product, and it was a big swing of 345. What, tell me, tell me why that saves them that much money. Okay, we are going to with the practice management as a service, which is we are going to become their back office. We will be able to replace her admin people. We will be able to replace her staff and preparers at a much much lower cost. So as well as will save her a lot of money on software. So she no longer has a pyramid of people? She doesn't have to. I mean, we will offer some selection if, they, if she wants to keep a couple of key people as managers. But th this will be done in an individual configurator for what she wants. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Damien Howard? Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering, have you filed for or obtained any type of uh, patent protection? No, we have not. Okay, well, I'll follow up on that question. Do you have any trademarks or any other IP that you, you have protected? We have the trademark for Clarity. Uh, and we're looking at, we have a product coming out <laughs> uh, shortly in a release that we're going to look at patent protection for. Any other questions we have pending? I don't see any other hands raised. All right, going once, twice. How much time do we have? Um, we have Steven? a minute. A minute left. All right, uh, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, um, maybe I missed it. What what exactly is the the, the pricing model? Uh, the pricing model is going to be on the software side. It's per user in the firm and based on just what pieces of software they're taking on the outsourced practice management as a service side, it's gonna be basically 
it's going to be based on what they select. For instance, how many preparers they want, how many managers they want, what kind of admin support they want. Okay, and what's the range? Uh, the range is Clarity, the app by itself, right now typically runs, we have about an average of 10 users. So 10 times 50, it's about six grand just for Clarity, the app. Uh, for a million dollar firm, we think it's gonna run somewhere in the range of, they'll be paying us 70,000 a year if they take the whole solution, maybe 80. Okay, thank you. The time is up. Uh, Chris, I guess. Okay, just real, real quick question. Uh, what are uh, customer acquisition costs? Uh, they're running about 20%. It's a little bit difficult to tell because we're not really scaled up to know, you know, really exactly. But we're, we think we're at 20 and we think that's where we're going to be. Thank you. All right. Is that time, Stephen? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, good presentation. Thank you. This was All fun. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, judges, please um, evaluate the company uh, on the platform. The link is in the chat. Make sure you um, evaluate the right company, which is Clarity. Um, Ron, good morning or good afternoon. Um, so I, you're emailing me, so I was trying to do this at the same time. Um, so uh, you're in here now. Um, also, uh, just want to ask you, when you signed up for F Success, did you use the .me or or the me.com or the Gmail? So I'm able to get you in. You're on mute, Ron. So uh, what was the question? The question is when you signed up for F success, was it the me.com or the gmail.com? It was, a, it was Gmail and all the documents have gone to uh, a Weissman of band angels. So okay. I think there's some email confusion. I will, um, I will, I'll try to fix that. Meanwhile, uh, Carrie, um, go ahead. If you want to introduce yourself, tell us what you do. And then also Ryan and Damon. Yes, my name is Carrie Barnes. I'm a partner here at Buckhalter. We are a general practice law firm uh, situated on the West Coast, handling corporate litigation. I'm in our intellectual property corporate group. So I assist in uh, IP assessments, transactions, uh, diligence and in, in acquisitions. We're using IP as collateral um, across the board between trademarks, patents and copyrights. Uh, one of our other sponsors, Ryan Johan, Hi. Uh, yep. Thank you so much, Carrie. Ryan Johan, uh, KPMG. I do business development for our emerging growth um, and venture back practice here in Southern California, uh, focused on accounting services. And Damian Howard. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, so I'm a partner at Kenobi Martins. Uh, we specialize in intellectual property. Uh, we do all types of intellectual property and all types of technologies. Uh, I personally specialize in software and hardware patent protection for a small to medium sized clients. Okay, thank you very much um, to all the sponsors. Very much appreciated. Um, we have the next company coming in. It's Endura Lock. Endura Lock. Raise your hand, please, so we're able to bring you in. Thanks, Harold. Okay, Authenticate. I uh, will bring you in right after Endura Lock because uh, you weren't on earlier or you used it. It looks like you used a different email address, so we didn't recognize you. Um, so you're on right now. Harold, uh, please uh, share your screen, uh, start video and audio on mute. And uh, when you get started, we will start the time. Let me know if, if you can see the screen. We can. Okay. Hello, my name is Dr. Harold Hess. CEO of Enduralock. 
As a mature industry, the fastener industry has not seen innovation in decades. That is changing with the introduction of Endurolux disruptive technology. For the first time, a permanently locking fastener that yet is reversible and reusable. In aerospace, the requirement for a self-locking nut is to withstand 30,000 cycles of vibration. We took ours up to 300,000. We've also cycled the product on and off 250 times. There is no competing product that provides for high vibration resistance, even with loss of preload or clamping force with easy reversibility and reusability in a harsh environment. I'm a board certified neurosurgeon and co-founder of a spinal implant and orthopedic company called Spinal Simplicity. I originally invented the locking technology for a spinal implant, but I realized that it would have many industrial applications. So I kept the IP separate, licensed it to the spine company and put it into Endurolock. An engineer at heart, I hold over 60 patents in my name. Diana earned her MBA with a focus in entrepreneurship, and she has over eight years of experience working in the startup world. She runs daily operations, and she ma uh, manages our aerospace AS9100 quality system. Igor has over 30 years of experience in aerospace fasteners. He was the former VP of R&D at Lisi Aerospace, one of the top three aerospace fastener companies in the world. Deep Tesh is our product manager who specializes in simulation engineering. Although Endurolock fasteners have many attributes, a key attribute is that it reduces the time and cost of installation and maintenance. If one looks at a Huck bolt, it's a permanent fastener, but it requires specialized tooling to apply, needs to be cut out to be removed, it's one-time use, and it cannot be retentioned. Safety wire is very labor intensive, therefore expensive. Castle nuts have the disadvantage of only having six gradations of torque per revolution. With Endurolock, it's a simple off the shelf six point socket to apply it or remove it. We can offer 50 gradations of torque and we can also retention. We've gone to great lengths to secure our intellectual property. We currently have 12 US patents issued, a Canadian patent, two European patents, and we are patent pending on over 20 others. Over the last few years, we have made significant inroads with the companies you see before you. Superior Energy and the US Army were our first two customers. We currently license to Aerofasteners, which is the number two Indian aeros aerospace and defense fastener manufacturer and supplier. Indian's national space program recently approved our technology for attachment of the base ring to the capsule for manned flight. India's defense division has requested fasteners to perform qualification testing to replace fasteners that are currently used in missiles, eliminating safety wire. Broma manufactures crane spreaders used at ports, and they have requested product for two applications. Airbus, Boeing, and Bell Helicopter are all interested in our new self-aligning nut plate, which will greatly reduce the time and cost of access panel maintenance and installation. Last year, we won NASA's competition. Goddard and Marshall are currently completing a cost projection to perform qualification testing for future missions. We also won a Shell oil challenge last year, and we are currently scaling our fasteners up to two to three inch diameter bolts to provide for the first locking bolt for pipelines. AFWERX, a division of the Air Force and Space Force, recently had a space challenge open to companies of all sizes. Out of over 800 companies, we were one of 26 selected to move forward for potential contracting. Lastly, we are a top three finalist currently in the Abu Dhabi International Petroleum Exposition Conference for Oil and Gas Startup of the Year. This is the largest oil and gas expo in the world. We're projecting revenues of approximately 57 million at year five with an EBITDA of about uh, 15. As Endurolock fasteners can be utilized in countless additional industries, we anticipate that these numbers will dramatically increase over time. We plan to sell directly to customers as well as to license. We're projecting an exit in five years with an EBITDA multiple of about 15. We're, this is our second round of funding. It is for 2 million of which OPAP has been subscribed and 120,000 is committed. The capital will be used primarily for further intellectual property, R&D commercialization, including tooling. Fasteners such as ours have simply never existed until now. Our focus is simple, create innovative, never before seen technology that not only meets, but far exceeds the needs and wants of our customers. Nuts, bolts, washers are used literally everywhere. So the scalability of Endurolock fasteners is almost limitless. Thank you. All right.
We can't hear you, Carrie. Sorry, too many mutes. Uh, Robert Stacy is our first hand raise. Uh, interesting presentation. Thank you. So my question, since I didn't see it in the slides, is what is your go-to-market strategy, and how do you know that it's effective? We're we're currently a member of the Aerospace Industries Association. By that, uh, either I or my VP of Engineering attend the uh, National Aerospace Standards Committee meetings, uh, which are three times a year. Through that, we meet all of the uh, standards engineers from all the primes. We actually have two fastener standards, uh, new national aerospace standards uh, assigned to us. We're currently working on three others. We also go to trade shows and obviously the competitions that I've mentioned. Thank you, Harold. OK, okay uh, Damian Howard. Great presentation. Uh, if, if I understood or heard you correctly, it sounded like um, this product was first developed for spinal applications. Uh, have you had any sales or success um, in, in that uh, area? Yes, that, that, that's my second company, which is Spinal Simplicity. They've been to market in the U.S., I believe now, uh, six years uh, in Europe, but probably about nine or ten. Um, and they are doing uh, extremely well with key opinion leaders across multiple uh, hospitals around the U.S., including Cedar sinai in L.A., uh, Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, and Rush Medical in Chicago. Thank you. Uh, Bob Warshire? Uh, yes, great presentation. I picture the sales cycle is exceedingly long. Could you, I mean dealing with the military and foreign countries. Uh, like, how does this work? And is there a way to make it go faster? Uh, there's no way to make it go faster, unfortunately, but it is a long sales cycle. Superior Energy, um, we've been working with them for three years and they just commercialized a month ago. Um, now, the thing to keep in mind with a number of these uh, sales cycles is that although it's long, once you get there and you're, in, you're actually selling, it's a dramatic jump in revenues. Yes. Uh, Superior Energy, for example, probably represents about 50,000 in sales for qualification items. Um, they do about 12 wells per year. And when you do the math, it represents about a little over a million in recurring revenues per year. The same is true with Airbus. I had a meeting with them at their request with their engineering team uh, last February, the virus hit, everything was kind of put on hold. And then I was notified more recently from them that uh, they wanted their procurement division to have a meeting with us. And that occurred a few weeks ago. Again, they're looking at a future uh, at their next platform. So um, if we get the, the uh, contract with them or, or a license through another manufacturer that supplies them, then uh, you'll have qualification items probably next year. Uh, go to market as far as actual production will probably be, I'm guessing, two to three years. And that's true with all, all of these uh, uh, sales cycles. Okay, John Harbison. Yeah, um, so in some of these big aerospace companies, I have some familiarity with some of them, and they tend to have decision making, obviously, in the the engineering area as well as the procurement, but in a company like Boeing, they don't. The procurement parts of Boeing don't like suppliers to go talk directly to the engineers to come up with better solutions because they're being measured in a different way, because they're measured by how much they can get the cost of each fastener down, and it's a different set of metrics. So you got these siloed companies. How do you expect to go through on a direct approach and? You mentioned licensing, you know, how do you weigh the direct approach versus the license approach where you also have a better chance of getting over their reluctance to rely on a new supplier that, you know, hasn't yet proven itself in terms of quality and repeatability? Well, a few, a few items to, to consider. Um, number one, as I mentioned, we do have new national aerospace standards. By definition, when you have a standard, any manufacturer can manufacture to the specs of that standard. However, if there's intellectual property involved, then a license has to be created. When I was at Airbus in February in Toulouse, I was specifically asked if I would be open to licensing to Lisi Aerospace, 
which is one of their major fastener suppliers. The other thing to keep in mind is that we are not a commodity fastener. We, our products, in essence, uh, save uh, time and therefore money. And that's, for example, what was of interest to Airbus as well as to Gulfstream. Boeing commercial is also interested as is uh, Boeing, the, the Chinook program for helicopters, again, because of the um, time savings and cost. At the moment, Boeing is on hold only because of the issues that they currently have, as well as the aerospace industry in general. Are you All right, Harold, really time's up, I'm sorry. Um, um, Ryan, was that, you just asked this question, right? Or no, you you haven't. Lisa's next. So Lisa, you can ask the question while we are transitioning for to the next presenter. Okay, um, a couple quick questions. Um, what, what is your uh, regulatory compliance um, participation? Do, do you have to do regulatory compliance or do, do your customers have to do it? <laughs> Uh, when it comes to FAA, it's systems that get certified, not the individual bolt. So uh, it's if Boeing or Airbus were to use the product in a particular subsystem, then that's what gets certified by FAA. Okay. And do you have um, general aviation in your target market future? Uh, at, at some point, we will try to get a... a uh, a meeting at, at Cessna, if that's what you're referring to. I mean, what we've been focusing on is commercial aerospace as well as military, and more recently, space applications. Uh, through the um, AFWORKS uh, space challenge that we were successful in, we've already had introductions made to, for example, the aerospace company or corporation um, in El Segundo, which is the largest um, government funded space. Uh, corporation for research and development. Thank you. Harold, great presentation. Thank you for being here. Um, we're going to move on to the next company, uh, which is Authenticate. Uh, please uh, evaluate Harold's company, Enduralock, uh, while we're transitioning. Ron, uh, you should have access. I want to make sure. Yes, I, yeah, I have, I, I have access to uh, the files now. Perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Authenticate, um, who's going to present? Uh, Evan and, okay. Hello. Hello, Ivan. Anyone else is going to present with you or just you? Um, it'll just be me today. Perfect. Okay. All right. You can share your screen whenever you're ready, and uh, we'll start the time when you start. Uh, can you guys all see the screen pretty well and everything? Sure can. Cool. All right. Then I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Evan Blasman, and I'm here to present Authenticate to you. We are a single smartphone-based solution securing all the company's infrastructure with one simple application. Ultimately, we're providing companies with more security and less burden. So, so sorry, go to this. Here's my desktop. Sorry. So when we look at security, it all boils down to one problem, and that is determining who has access to what. And in today's modern world, this has emerged into two completely separate industries trying to solve the same problem. We know these typically as digital authentication, which is you know passwords and multi-factor solutions, and physical access controls. So these are keys and smart cards. However, they both have they are both trying to solve one part of a bigger problem, and they introduce other smaller problems along with it. So in digital access control, we have phishing attacks, which all you guys know are very prevalent today. And statistics are very overwhelming, with an average cost of a data breach being almost four million dollars. And if you look at the physical access control side, we've been quoted that installation for a door reader is almost $2,500. And that's not even considering the management overhead and the headaches they run into trying to manage and delegate these cards when they get lost and other sorts of issues that arise with them. So here at Authenticate, we're trying to solve the bigger problem that both these companies are just band-aid solutions for. And that is using single device authentication, which means using your phone as your one credential for everything physical and digital. 
So this means we replace passwords entirely, as well as get rid of keys and access cards and replace them using your smartphone to get into your infrastructure. So we've kind of developed this architecture in a way to make users' lives more simple. However, we've also developed it to make sure that we provide more security along with it. So we've made it in a way that it's resistant to all software-based attacks. It's fully distributed authentication ecosystem. So what this means is that there's no centralized database with a bunch of credentials for someone to hack into and steal and therefore leak. And like I said before, we get rid of all passwords altogether and there's no, therefore there's no more credentials to copy and no more credentials for someone to get fished. So if we look a little bit closer about how this works, this is any device, let it be a phone, a server, a door reader, a car, whatever it could be. At the lowest level, you have hardware. And above that, you have an operating system that runs on this hardware. And above that, you have applications and programs that get built for the operating system. We run our security module, which has been patented in the trusted hardware on a device. So what this does is it, is it creates a barrier between the operating system and apps and programs from our security module. So therefore, if you have a malicious app or program or say the operating system actually gets compromised, you can trust that the interactions that go through our security module are trusted and secure. And what this does is it really gives us a, a nice competitive edge. This is one of the reasons because our security module runs on everything. It's the same code base that runs on a laptop, runs on a server, runs on a door and runs on phones, which means we can iterate really quickly and upgrade new features. So if new protocol comes out that we want to implement, we're able to do that pretty trivially. And if there's no secure hardware for us to leverage, then we can also emulate the security module and software, which really allows the ubiquity of this software to be uh, more prevalent throughout different applications. This is the team that we've assembled to kind of market this technology and create a company. Chad, the CEO, uh, is a computer security expert and has looked, worked at MIT Lincoln Laboratory for the Department of Defense, where he actually developed and patented this technology for them. Rita has um, taken all the operation sides of things, leading all of our marketing sales and making sure our external image gets out to everyone. And myself, I've been leading our hardware design, making our custom PCBs, as well as leading the mobile app development for Android and iOS. If you look at the market opportunity that we're playing in, like I said before, we play in two completely separate markets that are both respectively very large. You know, 43.4 billion projected by 2025. But more interestingly, if we look at the launch market that we're targeting, defined by California companies less than 500 employees, there's a $240 million projected market. So if we're able to grab just percentages of this, which we're confident we're able to, that'll be a nice launch market return on investment right there. And so our revenue model, we also want to make very simple for people to understand. It's a per user per month tiered subscription, depending on what solution you want. So if you want only physical access control, it's $10, digital, same thing, $10, and a full package would be $18 a month per user. And we also sell our hardware door readers at a significantly price at $250, which is a one-time fee just to cover our costs. In the future, we also plan to partner with companies like Rippling and Opta that make us easier to integrate with and be more used throughout larger corporations. If with this revenue model in our markets, we kind of project an optimistic of $80 million in five years of revenue, but more interesting on this side is kind of our go as like our launch strategy. So right now we're currently in the regional launch and developing an enterprise solution phase of things. And once we expand our integrations, we really predict a global launch to be kind of eminent within the next two years, which is really where our revenue will tick up. With that, I'll kind of leave you with this note that, you know, kids today don't know what a CD is. And here at Authenticate, we want tomorrow the kids will not know what a password or a key is. And so with that, we hope you'll join what we're calling the authentication revolution. All right, uh, I, I actually raised, I'm gonna be the first question. Um, so the technology was, was developed and patented under Lincoln Labs. Do you have licenses to that then? Um, yes, we have the license. Yeah, so the MIT owns the license to the patent and uh, Chad is the inventor, I mean, as the inventor we have it uh, like in our inbox ready to sign today. So that's kind of our next few items. So we'll be licensing it from them. And then after that, uh, I know you deal with all the trademarks and stuff. We have trademarks to our name is kind of our next protection for Authenticate. Okay, uh, next question will come from Christopher Yang. So ubiquitous computing isn't a, a, a new concept, right? And even with uh, the hardware uh, portion that, that you kind of injected into this ecosystem, can you talk about uh, how how you're going to authenticate user? Because regardless whether it's being done uh, on the device level or uh, centralized in the server, uh, you still need to be able to track the identity of those users, right? Correct. Yes, yes. 
So what we're using is a public and private key uh, security scheme. And so the way it works is that the private key stays on every single user's phone in hardware and it never leaves. No one can ever get that out unless you're you know, a nation state who dissolves in NASA and that sort of deal. Therefore, we you store the public key for everyone on our servers and then all of our access control devices, so your laptop, doors, whatever it will be, has the list of approved public keys for that device. And therefore, when devices interact with each other, that whether it be USB, Wi-Fi, NFC, Bluetooth, which we're all able to implement, it therefore checks the access controller for the public and private key pair to make sure that they're authenticated as you do. I see. And, and I guess the following question is, what are, what are the cost saving then in, in this case, right? Because you talk about this being an uh, advantage in terms of uh, having the, uh, the data being distributed versus centralized, right? So yeah, uh, you kind of talk about that as well, just second part of it. Thank you. Yeah, so that's an interesting question because it really depends on the implementation of the company. And when we talk cost savings, we always kind of have to break it up into like the physical side of things and the digital side of things and also management overhead. So what we're really offering is a whole solution to manage all these, all your company's assets, which number one cuts costs on door readers because it's physically cheaper to install and implement. So there's cost savings there. On the digital sides of things, we protect your company from number one, phishing attacks and also other software based, you know, malicious actors. And so it's a preventative cost in that sense. However, the real cost savings that you see immediately is on administrative overhead. So I know you guys have all probably seen statistics like 30% of all admin times is set on resetting passwords and you know, those sorts of things. This really frees up the admin's headache of trying to reset all these passwords and manage all these user accounts with one simple interface that they can kind of customize per device. And the goal is that when you hire a new employee, that all this stuff is automatically provisioned to their laptops and everything that they want to interact with. So when they show up on day one, they don't have to set up anything at all and everything should just work. So we're trying to really streamline this process and kind of take out a lot of management and logistical overhead. This Thanks. is a very crowded market. How are you going to establish yourself as a standard? What kinds of partners can you leverage so that you, you know, so that there's enough weight behind you of major companies that you become the standard? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. So it's interesting. You're, and you're totally correct. In each respective market, we have gigantic players, right? We have Google, Apple, Microsoft on the authentication side. On the other side, we have you know HID and these other access control systems. The one unique perspective that we have is being able to unify these two systems. But in each side, what we want to do is really kind of first start with a couple local small companies and then really leverage our government connections, which is what this was designed for. So a lot of our other competitors kind of you know want to solve this convenience issue, and they typically have security as an afterthought, and so therefore they don't target government markets necessarily right away. However, we've kind of flipped our design model and we started with security at the very bottom and then kind of also built upon and solved the usability issue of the user. And so this kind of gives us a unique perspective where we can kind of hopefully enter the government markets a lot sooner because this technology was developed working for the Department of Defense for the Department of Defense specific issues. So it's kind of a different approach. We kind of flip it versus trying to start small and kind of grow into the government market where we see a lot of uh, potential. Okay, Garrett Brown. Yeah, you, you touched on my first question, I think, in that answer to Ron just now. But as far as go to market, the, so I was going to ask, is the strategy to go enterprise, SMB, direct to consumers? It sounds like you're going to go SMB first and then go to more like government type enterprise. Is that accurate or am I missing any pieces there? Yeah, you're correct. So okay. right now, currently, we're selling to local companies that we kind of hand selected so that as a security product, we want to make sure that nothing will go wrong. And if something does, we're able to literally drive there in a moment's notice and fix it. After that, we're kind of looking to expand to larger enterprises and also the government. The okay. one problem with going straight to the government is that, you know, you have to get FIPS certification and all these other like security checks. And while that's taking time, we can leverage existing enterprises in the corporate market, which is kind of our next play. So while we're working on government certification, we're really looking at larger enterprises where we see they have the more pain points that we're solving specifically, and it would also be more beneficial for us to leverage bigger customers like that. And then you said that, I get the differentiator combining digital and physical mm -hmm. and trying to bring that all to one place. You mentioned Okta as a potential partner. You've got the Octas and the one logins of the world out there. 
Right. Why are you not competing with them? What's how does that relationship work? Aren't you, you trying to basically do what they do with hundreds of millions of dollars, except also add door keys? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. So they're really differentiator, right? When we talk about integrating with Okta, they were able to be the authentication mechanism they use. Therefore, once we're in with Okta, then their service can still work as usual, and they get it. Everyone gets into all their applications and websites and such. However, the real difference is that. The, the architectural difference is what we're uh, what, what really sets us apart, which is what I was talking about, where there's no centralized database of credentials to store. And so the, the point when we try to integrate with these companies is that we want to make sure that, you know, their systems are more secure, number one, and that they're easy to use, number two. So I don't know, are you asking specifically about Okta and these one, one passwords kind of sort of deals? Because for those things, we're trying to Yes, eliminate you know passwords altogether. So the, the one password sort of companies would be uh, like we try to be replacing them essentially. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. It, it sounds like a very similar value prop, with the differentiator being we do physical as well. Correct. Um, yes. So that was so, my question. Yeah. So the, the real the real the benefit that's there is once we're in with one product of ours, like a company needs to physically secure the infrastructure and. Do it. So we're able to offer both products completely separately, uh, kind of a strategic reason so that when, one, when we make a sale on one front, that it is possible at a click of a button on our admin's website to switch their over their infrastructure, whether it be go from digital to uh, physical or physical to digital in either sense, but really making sure that once, so the, I guess to answer your question more, more bluntly, I just want to tell you time has been up, Evan. So oh. finish it fast, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, well, then I, I would love to talk further to help answer any more questions. So I, I know we're out of time, but uh, feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to continue the conversation. Then. All right. I just have a very quick question for you. Why didn't the oh, yeah. CEO present? Uh, so here at Authenticate, we want to make sure that every one of the founders is able to present the company how it should be. And so we kind of take turns making sure that we're all able to present the way like that we want so this way all right not, not a convincing answer for me but that's okay uh and yeah. what was what was the term of the deal i'm not sure i saw that yeah so we uh raised on a previous save of 550,000, and we're looking to do another bridge round uh five um of around 500,000 or more uh the exact terms have not been set all right thank you very much yes thank you All right. Um, next in line is Gapes. Is that Micah? Uh, raise your hand, please. All right, Micah, here we go. Please evaluate, um, authenticate while Micah is getting set up. Um, and also the link for um, escapes is in the chat to be evaluated next. Um, Micah, can you uh, unmute and also share your video? All right, can everyone hear me now? We can. All right, hello, thank you. Uh, so, I'm here to talk about escapes. Uh, what if you could enjoy the benefits of a mini vacation at the fraction of the cost and during your lunch hour? Well, this is what I created escapes to do. So I truly believe that escapes will be the future of the spa industry and will become synonymous with this idea of virtual travel. Uh, since opening last year, I've seen an incredible cre increase in customers this year uh, to our location in Los Angeles. Uh, I have over 20 years of experience producing, designing, and developing interactive content. Uh, I've worked for Atari, Yahoo, AOL, Disney Interactive, and my last day job, if you will, was working for JPL, uh, and I left that job to actually pursue my interest in virtual reality. This is Mia, and Mia really represents the Escapes customer, uh, which has proven, been proven true at our, our Los Angeles location. So 
Uh, she represents a single 40-year-old working mom. And like many other people uh, similar to Mia, she doesn't have time to take a meaningful break, uh, doesn't really have the finance to, to go to some exotic place and, and do a really good vacation. She hears about escapes, she books an appointment online and comes to our location, and she is transported to a virtual exotic environment that really helps her calm her mind, helps her relax. And she enjoys it so much that she books again the following week. And in our case, we've seen in the last couple of months, she even brings a friend uh, to come with her. Escapes immersive relaxation uh, is an all new uh, novel uh, VR based experience. And uh, I have trademarked escapes immersive relaxation and I currently have a patent pending on this system. And I'll talk a little bit about it. So essentially it's combining, it's software which combines virtual reality worlds, which are rendered in real time, uh, paired with a premium massage chair, along with audio and aromatherapy diffusers, which disperse different scents in the air, as well as control fans and infrared heat lamps. All of these things are separate hardware components that are synced and triggered by my software. So for example, there's a tropical retreat uh, escape, uh, which is actually behind me. That's, my, uh, that's what you see behind me in the background. Uh, while you're in this environment, you see the palm trees moving, you feel the wind uh, from the fans. As the sun comes down, you feel the heat from the infrared heat lamps, which are triggered by the software. And then the aromatherapy diffusers trigger different scents, which puts you in that environment. Our current business model is uh, direct to consumer. So people book online, they uh, come to the location and they receive their appointment. Uh, each appointment is 30 minutes in length. Uh, and the price range is between 35 to $55. And that would vary depending upon the region that uh, escapes is licensed or is operating in. Our biggest market, so our target market is, is the health and wellness uh, industry. And globally it's worth over $4 trillion. And that includes spas, uh, meditation centers, float centers, you name it, yoga studios, et cetera. Our specific market though are spa goers and people who are looking for affordable massages basically. So your uh, you know, ma and pa kind of small massage parlors, which can you know, be in strip malls all the way to your very high end, you know, luxurious spas and hotels and resorts. Uh, because there hasn't really been a lot of innovation in the spa industry, uh, you know, over many years, we offer something that's really completely unique, 30 seconds. something totally new for this market. And just to show a little bit of our attraction, so our customers are unique based, 25 to 55, mostly women of color and single women are moms. Uh, the, our number one network effect is word of mouth. Uh, referrals have been the, the, the number one way we, we've gotten customers. Uh, and since opening, we've only been open a year. We had to close between March and June due to COVID, but we saw our sales increase over 115% this year. And our growth will be through licensing, franchising, and direct to consumer. Uh, we're currently seeking to raise our first seed round uh, of 750K to a million dollars uh, to do R&D, to provide management and logistics, and to really do the licensing uh, effectively across the U.S. And the big opportunity is bringing affordable travel, virtual travel, if you will, to the masses and really making people feel better on their regular daily or weekly routine. Thank you. All right, uh, Robert, Stacy. Oh, thank you, very interesting presentation. So my question is, is let's say I was the uh, uh, spa and I'm gonna license this. What's my capital cost and how, how many clients do I need before I start making some money? Sure, so the, 
there's an upfront cost of $25,000 for the hardware equipment and setup. And what I'd like to do is to try to get that cost down uh, specifically. And then beyond that, there's a monthly license fee of $500 per month per suite, if you will. And a suite is basically sort of in this image here, a room with all the equipment set up. Um, if you're charging $50 per appointment, uh, one of the real benefits of Escapes is that because it's all automated, it's actually a lot cheaper, even though you're, let's say your first year, your costs are going to be about $37,000 all in. That's still cheaper than the cost of a massage therapist, uh, you know, on salary for a year. Uh, and you would be able to really generate that cost back in theory within four months. If you're charging $50 appointment and if you have, you know, depending on your if you have a seven day, uh, you know, week of operation. Thank you. All right, next next questioner, Howard Mirowitz. Howard? I don't think Howard's mic is working. Uh, Hi, hello. Howard. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on twice because I uh, my video is intermittent on my computer, so I'm also using my phone. That's the reason. Anyway, um, yeah. I is there any human phase of contact with the uh, customer in the in the you know in the process of delivering the uh, the experience, or is it all done by you know automatic? automated means? Sure, it's a great question. So we definitely, so we definitely help the, the customer into the experience and explain what the experience is. And in fact, over 90% of our customers, it's their first VR experience. So I typically talk them through what they're gonna experience and try to explain uh, how, you know, uh, to, to get ready for the virtual experience. And the thing too is because this has never really been done before, uh, we typically guide the guest, you know, into the uh, experience. And also we provide PPE, uh, obviously in the last few months, uh, which is like a VR cover, uh, disposable gloves, et cetera which is also one of the positives. It's also one of the reasons why I think we've seen such a sharp increase in the last couple of months. Uh, it allows them to escape, you know, uh, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to escape these days. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question? The, um, do you see, suppose that you could increase the volume of the production of all the equipment by 10X, what you now think it is? Yes. Do you believe? Do you oh, believe that could be low enough to make this something that you could actually sell to homes? Yes, 100%. And in fact, that's why the, uh, really the large region why I'm trying to raise money is because one of the other patents that I have pending is a device which would literally do that. It, it would combine a lot of these external components uh, into a, a single unit that would essentially make it more affordable. Um, for, for not only just home use, but also for, for spas. I've, I've been approached by a number of, of really small spas um, and the 25K is just, it's the biggest hurdle right now and would love to try to get that down. Um, Amy and Howard? Yeah, that, that's it, go ahead. Regarding that 25K number, um, what, what's the utilization that you need to break even on a chair? That a, that a spa or a, or a hotel would need? How many, how many sessions a year would they need? Actually, well, if they're, do, if, if they're able to do basically $300 a month or something like that, then in theory, they can do it within the first year. Um, we offer financing as well if they want to amortize that cost over two years. But again, the, the, total cost for the first year would be around 37k including the license fee and then two related, that questions. First, two related that questions what about repeat how many of your customers have been repeats and um 
what what does what does the spa have to believe to buy or rent one of these from you? What what do they have to believe about their business to make it feasible to say, okay, I'll I'll, I'll go in with this? Sure. The biggest thing is that it's we're attracting, I think, younger single women uh, in ways in which uh, current spas, at least here in the LA area, are not. Uh, and then in terms of our repeat customers, in the last two months, we've had 30% of our customers repeat, and not just within the same month, we've had people come every week uh, and bring friends or refer friends, which I've you know rarely seen. And I think part of it has to do with the, the affordability of it. Uh, the $50 price point is much cheaper, much more reasonable than the 150, you know, at a Burke Williams, et cetera. And I think for a spa owner, that is, is sort of the key. The automation makes it a lot more uh, accessible. It, it, they don't have to have someone on staff to, you know, administer massages. So they can offer it at a lower price point. And it's a good way in which to get people through the door. In fact, I just closed the license with uh, a guy who owns a float center or a chain of float centers in the Denver area. And he's literally, that's what he's using Escapes for is to draw in a new customer and then offer a new service basically to round out his existing uh, offerings. All right, thank you, Micah, very much. Too bad it cannot do a massage, so. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. Good presentation. Um, uh, please evaluate um, Escape. Uh, again, the link is in the chat if you don't have the email with you. Uh, we will move to actually, uh, it is uh, right about halfway through 1 p.m. We're going to take an exact five minute break. So we'll be five minutes after the hour. Um, and then uh, we will continue with um, Gig X. Uh, John, be ready to present uh, in five minutes. Thank you.
Shaheen, how are you? Doing very well, thank you. Good, good. Yeah. Uh, I sent you the email, you saw my email? Yes, I did, I did. Okay, good, good. And those were your selection, right? You said uh, they're specifically the ones that you're interested in? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would also like to, if, if you get a chance to see if uh, you have a top tier of uh, what, what other people liked. Yep. I have a list of that to some that'd extent. Yeah, I know, be. I know, I know what Bob Warshower likes. I could tell you that. So what does he like? <laughs> <It's> uh, <deep>. <laughs> <laughs> he, Bob likes. Uh, I think Cast Twenty One is one of the ones he likes. Uh, Cast which Twenty One is one of my. I have a call with her tomorrow morning. Okay. Yeah. See, see if there's still room available. I, as I remember. She only had 250K, I thought, available, I thought. Which one was this, Bob? Cast 21. The, oh, what was it about? That's the, oh, it, the plastic cast versus uh, the uh, yes, cast. That was excellent, excellent, yeah. Hey, Ron, is that is that a backdrop behind you or is that a real, your, is that your house? <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, it's uh, the Bodleian Library uh, in England. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I thought that was your basement. So, <laughs> JJ, I have a yeah. technical question, real fast. Once yeah. we we fill out the um, questionnaire on the the side of each one of those companies, does it automatically go to you, or do I have to sit some nope. sort of submit? That you just click on it, it automatically saves. Okay. Yep. All right. So let's get started. Um, uh, John is ready. So here we go. All right, John, uh, when you're ready, you can uh, share your screen and get started. Can you see my screen? No, we Not can yet. see you, but you haven't shared yet. Hold on one sec. How about now? Looks about right to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, JJ. Uh, and uh, I wanted to thank you again for postponing last week. Uh, we were packing up our valuables in the middle of a smoke tornado. So, uh, yeah, so uh, John and I live maybe about a mile away from each other. We were we evacuated. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty scary. Um, yeah. But thank you, uh, hi everybody. My name is John Fox. I'm uh, a co-founder and CEO of GigX. Uh, our mission is to become the number one fractional talent network, the gig economy. Basically, we're allowing white collar workers to get access to the gig economy. And obviously with COVID-19 and the acceleration of layoffs and furloughs, we're, uh, I think, unfortunately in a good position. 
Hold on one sec. So I wanted to tell you just a quick story about Craigslist. Uh, everybody's familiar with Craigslist, been around for a long time. And uh, you could always rent rooms on Craigslist. And you could always buy tickets on Craigslist. So if that was the case, then there would be no room for StubHub and there would be no room for Airbnb. Similarly, you can go on LinkedIn and you can search for a number of needles in their haystack. But to be able to land in a network where there are people who have already raised their hand for fractional independent leadership roles, not only in the US, but around the world, um, that was pretty impossible to do. That was kind of the idea behind GigX and allowing those individuals who are director level and above, oftentimes 40 and above, to be able to transition into a portfolio career, uh, either by choice or by need because they were being let go of a full-time role. So there are a lot of drivers that are out there right now um, that we're probably all familiar with. 80% of the workforce will be gig workers by 2030. 94% of businesses plan to use contingent and gig workers. 73% do not have enough to retire. 60% plan to continue to work in some capacity because we're living longer. And there are about 720,000 director and above executives who are actually moving or in motion, meaning looking for a new role annually just around the US. So we build a, scale, a scalable SaaS platform, obviously by the name of GigX, which is a registered trademark. Uh, we have the ability to scale very quickly. There's high profit margin. And as I mentioned, and you see the logos down below on the slide, a lot of companies have already um, let go of employees, unfortunately. Uh, we know that it is going to expand dramatically uh, over the next two months and into Q1 of 2021. Uh, we're actually tapping into the WARN Act, which is where companies who are planning layoffs have to list with their states. So just two weeks ago, we're starting to mine that list and to create some funnels to be able to get ahead of the curve for the HR managers who are playing, who are planning uh, layoffs. So they can include a GigX membership in the severance package of those who are director level and above. Uh, we previously isolated our, uh, our SAM or serviceable addressable market being 330 billion. And that was based on 3.3 million people who are working in the gig economy who are making $100,000 or more. And that obviously ties to what Wharton has said about the global uh, economy for uh, gig work is going to be 2.7 trillion by 2025. But then we did a little bit more work in order to determine those director level and above, which is obviously 7 million if we put in the filter of 200 employees or more. If we take out that filter, it's 11 million. So you can see where we got the 720,000, which is our primary audience um, in the US. Uh, we believe that we have a, a great business model. We have first mover advantage. We have a very scalable infrastructure. Our, our tech stack is pretty nimble. 30 seconds. Yeah, we have an engaged user base. And then we've created this uh, infinity loop at the bottom, which our attorney believes is uh, patentable. Uh, so that's one of the things that we obviously want to use our funding for. Uh, we have an opportunity ecosystem here uh, where we go after the B2B market for them to be able to purchase a, kind of a, a, a white label version of our platform so they can build their own network. Uh, we have nine revenue streams that we have isolated. We have uh, multiple markets that we're going to be going after. Uh, this is our life cycle for our funding. And then this is the number of accounts and members and the percentage that are paid. We have raised 350. We're looking for 650. And then here's our roadmap. So did I move through that quickly enough for everybody? <laughs> Keep 
could you just go back and show the slide of what you've actually accomplished? You spent way too much time on trying to create, a, tell us about the market size. But it's more important for us to know what you've actually done. So could you go over this chart? Yeah, I can actually bring up the one. Well, so we, ha we actually have 504 accounts, uh, individuals who've created accounts, 43% of those have become members. And then 63% of those have paid. And the reason that there's a delta is because we have bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And the bronze membership is free right now. Have you placed anybody yet? Uh, we don't actually place. We're, we're a directory and we provide the handshake and then we get out of the way. And the reason that we set the business model as a one-sided model initially is because most of the people who are working as independent leaders uh, don't want people messing around with their business. They want to do their own gap analysis. They want to do their own proposals. They want to do their own invoicing. Do you have any success metrics to show us? Uh, Define success metrics as far as the people that, who have actually been hired. That your subscribers like this and are getting value from it in some way. That, that, that is what we need to work on more. We've been doing surveys to under who's getting hired, who's not getting hired, and uh, the monies that they're receiving. But we don't have an automated mechani mechanism to do that. All right, I got Damien, Damien Howard. Sorry, Damien uh, has the next question. Sure. So. You mentioned that you, uh, your attorney thinks this is patentable, but ha have you actually filed for patent protection yet? We have not. Uh, on the infinity loop, no, we have not. So that's meant to run in the background to attract individuals to our platform. And then also those companies that are looking to hire executive leadership for them to basically be messaged to consider hiring fractionally. And that would be running in the background to help offset our digital ad spend so that we're not, so our burn rate is low on digital ads. Okay, so I'm gonna remind our, our questioners to limit your question and, and to respond quickly. We have John Harbison next. Yeah, um, can you just uh, elaborate a little bit on how you charge in terms of what's flat dire or percent or a percent of what and how do you avoid disintermediation if they find somebody and then just keep going to them directly. Are you still able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. So here's our pricing. So it's $39 a month for silver, 59 for gold, 89 for platinum. And then if we go annual, they're basically paying for 10 months and getting 12 months. Here we got John Harbison next. Oh, John, was that your question just now? Yes, yes. Sorry, uh, David Friedman. David? Hi, David. We can't hear you, David. Can't hear you, you're on mute or something. Yeah. No. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. I got it. Sorry. Yeah. Screwy system. Um, anyway, uh, good to see you, John. I've been to see one. What is the two questions in one? What is yeah. the real value? If I'm looking as a gig worker making $100,000 a year, what's the real value to use you? And why don't I just use LinkedIn? Because, you know, LinkedIn, yeah, it's just the standard for most of the gig workers that I know in the management space. Yeah. So great question. Uh, we, we, we would like you to look at GigX as another channel, not the only channel. So obviously we're, we have a top level profile where our members will create their profile. They'll link to their LinkedIn account. They'll link into their consulting website. They'll link into all of their social media. So what, what we're doing, I think, is creating a network to allow other fractional leaders to find each other, to network with each other. When somebody lands, they typically do a gap analysis, and they're often bringing in other fractional leaders, or they're building virtual teams for individuals to assist them. So we think that there's a community aspect to this that we want to tap into further for all the people who basically raise their hand and want to be a part of our network. But that was not included in your presentation because that's a little different than just being a connector. Right. C correct. And we, we have a, 
we have a, a longer, larger deck. We had to cut it down to 15 pages. So I, I'd be happy to share that with you later, David. I appreciate it. Yeah. Time is up. Time is up. All right, uh, John, thank you so much. Good presentation. Thanks, JJ. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Yeah, have a great day. All right, so uh, next in line, please evaluate um, GigX. Um, again, the link is in the chat. Also, uh, it's in the email. And then we'll bring on next is, uh, I think, Joseph March, Iconic Allure. Joseph, raise your hand. Thank you, Joseph. <clears throat> All right, Joseph, whenever you're ready, please uh, unmute, um, start your video, share your screen, and you can begin. Uh, Ron, just a quick note, uh, you, um, you can raise your hand for the questions, so that way they go in order. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, and you... No. There you go. We can hear you now. Is everything kosher? Okay. Um, so fashionable aerospace for a protected tomorrow. In 2011, just on the street from where I grew up, a senator and 18 others were injured. And then in 2017, I'm sorry, full screen mode. And then in 2017, I thought enough is enough when a church massacre in Texas left 26 fatally wounded and 20 others injured. Iconical Lore was born with the mission to provide consumers with the peace of mind in the event of pending danger. We provide fashion and activewear that has discreet bullets of protection for business professionals like yourself, as well as your spouse, partner, parents, and kids. Now here are the facts. The U.S. has 5% of the world pop and a third of all mass shootings. There are 173 shootings from 09 to 17, and unfortunately, the majority of Americans aren't protected in harmful situations. Our solution is combining aerospace with fashion, taking two existing materials currently used in the aerospace industry. The first is used in fighter jets, and the second protects astronauts from micrometeorites. With these materials, we're creating flexible, breathable, bullet-resistant clothing that you'll hardly know you're wearing. What's great is the market is already growing. Traditionally, body armor is normally associated with law enforcement and the military. When it comes to the general public, most want to be protected yet without the unwanted attention. We're redefining the body armor market by diverging into the flexible 83.8 .8 billion athleisure industry in addition to law enforcement. Our go-to market strategy is broken down into three phases with a mixture of hard and soft body armor. First, we're providing uniforms to law enforcement through a contract structure on milestone payments. During this time, we'll build our revenue and begin preparing the launch for phase two and three. Phase two launches our private security sector and professional line followed by a launch to the wider public to whom we're providing jackets, outfits, and activewear. Currently, our competitors have ballistic apparel and products that are expensive, standard, or impractical as the most definitive solution. Think bulletproof backpacks and clipboards and high-end couture. Our business model consists of online, direct, and retail sales, as well as contracts. As shared, phase one will bring to market the hard body armor for law enforcement. Due to our tiered launch, we expect the hard body armor to break even in 12 to 18 months, which provides additional funds for bringing the activewear to market. As a whole, we expect, to, we expect to break even at 24 to 30 months based on market feedback and the potential for profit by the third year. Here's our completed and inspected milestones. We have supplier partner confirmations and documentation to assist with the due diligence process and utilizing current aerospace tech. We intend to complete R&D and necessary certifications here shortly. Then file the IP agreements to begin, begin preparing for phase one launch in November. We're not alone. Exova is sourcing and certifying our hard body armor while fabric type is a key resource we're using for athleisure prototyping, reducing costs and bridging the gap between aerospace and fashion. Our team has extensive combined experience in aerospace, fashion and startups, specializing in operations, supplier quality and international product and apparel representation. We're asking for 1.2 million at 10 to 25% equity. As you can see, we have a detailed use of funds breakdown with the potential for investor return. So why now? Mass shootings are increasing at an alarming rate in the US and abroad. Now is the time to bring this to market and as such, we're looking for investors to join us in protecting and saving lives. 
Iconical lawyers bring a fashionable era space for a protected tomorrow. And that's it. Can you hear me? All right, Howard Merowitz, is our first question. Hi, um, interesting presentation went by pretty fast, so I, I didn't quite catch everything. But talk about pricing and cost. How much does it cost you to build, say, a sport jacket or something? And how much is the retail price of these typical items of apparel compared to um, normal clothing? Typical price of these apparel uh, at the current market rate, you see anywhere from about six hundred to a thousand dollars or more, depending on the materials that go into it. Uh, as far as the cost, some of them are using nano materials, which is what we're doing, but we found a cheaper way uh, to build to pretty much make it. You're looking around about what thirty dollars, thirty to forty five, and that's based on you know just more materials and reducing the cost and things of that nature. So we're talking about 375 to about 525 is what we tend to charge. And then the marginal cost will bring it down over some time. Okay, and so you say you're, so wait, yeah, do I tested? understand? Go ahead. So in here, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. have you tested uh, those prices against your market? They sound high. Uh, yes, uh, we pretty much did a customer call summary for this other pitch competition in Irvine back in May during the like right after the lockdown or during the lockdown. So we kind of got some of the customer feedback across the country. So we called about 20, 30 different firms, you know, companies, and some of them were business to customers, like, and then some are individual stores, you know, and some things of that nature. So. Ryan Johan? Let me unmute myself here. Good job, Joseph. Great uh, presentation. Um, just a quick question about, um, you said your, your competition that right now they're not, they're, they're kind of overpriced. Um, do you see that as a potential threat for them to be able to kind of um, provide maybe like a cheaper product that may be inferior to yours or like, how do you guys see yourself competitive position there? Oh yeah, um, sorry. Wait, hold up. Um... I don't see that as too much of a as too much of a problem. I think what it really comes down to, and this is my understanding with I guess the closest competitor, whether they came after us, regardless, like Innocent Armor, was that they just people don't understand like they don't understand the concept of wearing body armor as an apparel item. You know what I mean? They think of body armor typically as like I don't know, right, like riot police or something of that nature that cops and military wear. And so it's it's really breaking that down into that no, we're in the times where now you're not really safe anywhere for various reasons, you know, but that's kind of what it is, breaking that barrier. I see that as, it, as like the hardest thing with the consumer, but as far as the, like the people themselves and the competition, there's room to grow. And so you're seeing a divergence. That's what that 30% um, of the consumer basically growing, into, they're growing into the apparel market. So there's room for all of us to grow right now. And so I wouldn't say I have a first mover advantage that I say that was not the case, but at the same time, there's plenty of room, so. Kathy. Preby? Preby, that's Preby. right. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, a couple of questions about the markets. As I understood it, you have multiple, you're targeting multiple verticals. One, yes. you mentioned law enforcement, and then you mentioned apparel. If you look out over the next 18 months, where do you see the greatest opportunities within the verticals? 18 months, and what do you think, what do, would you anticipate revenues coming in from those verticals to be? Oh, so we found it was one way. It was one way, like to pretty much build on the LEO and the RFQs, the request for proposals. Uh, we found a stun gun called the Rayson X1 that has like multiple attachments, but basically they can combine. They can like have a pepper ball, a sound can, and like different attachments that look like toner cartridges. So we just use it as a proxy. It doesn't exist in the U.S., and you just need an import license. So we would use that to build, rep, like, be able to grow. Um, that's one avenue. Uh, the consumer, that's another avenue, and we'll definitely, we're going, we'll have room to grow, but you say, like, what's the biggest issue? Uh, I would say Arizona and where, we're, where we currently stand, because everything, like, California is hemorrhaging people, and so is New York, and then they go next door to California, like, to, to here, and then also to 
we, we basically turn blue. So in that, what you're gonna see is a, a clash of cultures and combined with the amount of crime that we have here in Tucson, et cetera. Uh, that's, there's just room to grow. We wanna start regionally with the areas that have like the riots where people don't feel safe, let's just, such as in Cali, you kinda, you, the laws don't support being able to defend yourself for the most part. So that's kind of when we wanna spread it out. I don't know how to say, yeah. So I, I have a question myself. How, 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 how good does this work compared to the, the conventional body armor? Oh, yeah, it works, it works quite well. Uh, we pretty much have the prototype going out next week. We've done open source research from like making the patent, something in here, uh, I would have moved it over, but pretty much that uh, the hard body armor works. That's an aerospace composite. So we're just looking at, can we slim it down? It'll stop an AR-15 round, no problem. And then as far as the soft composite, it's a combination of a blast fabric that we're reconfiguring for the consumer market. So we're combining it with sure thickening fluid, which is the old cornstarch uh, water experiment, or yeah, but the old cornstarch experiment. Essentially, we smack it, it turns to a solid back to a liquid. So we think very well. We just need to know to what extent before we enter R&D. So it's a four-type prototype process for us, a four-part prototype process. The first is just seeing, we already know that we can impregnate it. I just have to get it done this weekend. The second part is essentially, and then we also want to see, uh, we want to see by how much does it resist impact, unimpregnated versus impregnated. And then the second portion is to take a less lethal caliber, which is like basically what you see in the market, like a pepper ball TCP. And then we're going to shoot an inert round at it to see how it functions. And then the third part is, the, is for the orders of stuff from two ball, essentially. We have pretty much have graphene powder. And I could just, I have the homogenizer, just mix it together and do what I need to do. And then I want to see what it, how the carbon nanotubes actually, you know, how does it perform versus the R&D, just raw, sheer thickening fluid that was provided to us by the University of Delaware, you know? So. Okay, All right, Joseph. A... Time's up. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. I understand. Uh, Thank you. I'll, we'll let uh, Howard, uh, quick question, Howard, while we're transitioning. Can't hear you, Howard. Can't hear you. Sorry. What ha, have you had people wear this at all? And have you collected any information on the wearability, meaning comfort, you know, and weight, et cetera, et cetera? What's their reaction? Well, essentially, uh, as far as wearing it, it would be wearing apparel. So this thing is, is going to be sauna, sauna bonded. You're not going to be able to see it or know that it's actually in the apparel itself, being that's a blast fabric, but it's very abrasive. You wouldn't want to wear it. But it's not heavy. But at the same time, it's like it's not an exposed fabric because it's hydrophilic. So the weather conditions, you know, that would be an issue. Um, as far as the hard composites, the pretty much as far as the police don't really mind. They're more worried about functionality. So it's less about looks. You know, blue and black are the most common colors. They don't have an issue. Whereas the consumer doesn't want to look like they're just walking into a Walmart and end up in a situation. All right. Thank you, Joseph, very much. Uh, good presentation. Thank you. So much. All right, uh, we will have uh, next is um, skin knowing. All right, Jackie, thank you for raising your hand. Okay, Jackie, whenever you're ready, uh, you can share your screen and uh, you get started. Hi everybody, um, my name is Dr. Jackie Levin and I'm a biochemical engineer and a board certified dermatologist and I'm excited today to tell you about my software solution, Skin Knowing. Just to give you a little background, when it comes to beauty and personal care products, these products have less government oversight than any other type of consumer product out there today. 
So safety has become a real issue and concern. The EWG organization and a survey of over 600 cosmetic manufacturers found 93 different chemicals in 81,000 products that are associated with cancer, birth defects, or reproductive harm. Because of the growing concerns about safety, a concept called clean beauty was born. Clean beauty is a term that communicates to consumers that this brand or product does not have any ingredients in it that can cause harm. This concept of clean beauty is becoming more and more popular as people's concerns grow regarding the ingredients and products today. The clean beauty market globally is expected to reach 54 billion by 2025 in the, in the US 7.6 billion by 2025. The problem is that there's no universal definition of clean beauty that works for everyone. A skincare product that may be the perfect clean beauty solution for one person may cause harm for another person. Skin Knowing's innovative solution enables a consumer to avoid any product containing any personally harmful ingredients. We do this by offering personal analysis and tailored safety recommendations. Introducing Skin Knowing, our software tells you in simple terms what to avoid and what is safe based on your profile and your DNA. Our algorithm mimics an in-office dermatology assessment with in-depth user analysis plus DNA analysis using your raw data file from 23andMe and Ancestor DNA. How does it work? You can start using skin knowing in three simple steps. Step one is to build your profile and health survey. This is a five minute survey that gets to know you all the way down to your DNA. Step two, our software reveals your custom ingredient avoid list based on your unique risk factors and concerns. And finally, step three is to find the right products for you. You can do this in three different ways. You can get recommendations from our affiliated experts, use our product finder tool or our ingredient library. Skin Knowing has both business to business and business to consumer applications. Our target for our business to business solution is enterprise online retailers such as Sephora, Amazon and Ulta Beauty. We will generate revenue from a non-recurring setup fee and a monthly recurring charge equaling the total contract value of 600,000 a year. For a business to consumer model, our target is millennials and Generation Z females. We will generate revenue from membership subscriptions, affiliate link commissions, and from paid advertising on our site. As far as competition, many sites today are clean beauty focused. However, that's where the similarities stop. Skin Knowing is the only platform to get to know its user in depth, including DNA analysis, and the only software to offer personalized ingredient and product recommendations. Our goal is to change the industry standard for clean, clean beauty. Here we summarize our financial projections for our business to business and business to consumer application. Our forecast reaches 11.9 million over five years. Our conservative business assumptions are listed here. Skin Knowing is completely self-funded by me at this point. I've invested 300,000 to get our MVP done. We value the company at 33 million, which is based off our three-year projected revenue at 5X valuation. And I'm looking for 1.65 million for 5% of my company. We'll be using this money to hire more people, build out our team, as well as for marketing and PR and continued software development. As far as our timeline, our provisional patent application will be done this week and our MVP will be complete by the end of the year. It includes all of the features discussed here today. In the new year, we plan on a soft launch, applying for utility patent, adding to our R&D team and starting a pilot program for our B2B business. In Q2, we will hire marketing and PR to do social media engagement and help us expand our influencer partnerships. And in, Q3 and Q4, our plan is to expand our business development and really target the B2B market. I'm so lucky to be working with a team of experts on skin knowing. Brett Tyson is our CRO. He has 20 years experience in technology sales-based organization and business development. He was VP of sales uh, for many software companies that have been acquired, including InContact, which was acquired by NICE for $1 billion. We also have an R&D team made of PhD and medical doctors. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I'm Dr. Jackie Levin, and this is Skin Knowing. All right, we have a number of hands raised, um, so please keep your questions short and to one only and um, respond succinctly so we can get through all these questions. 
John Harbison is going to be our first question. Um, great presentation. Uh, my question is, um, how do you create a database of all the ingredients of these kinds of products, given that a number of the ingredients, I'm sure, are proprietary and not necessarily listed? So the FDA actually requires that for every cosmetic and beauty personal care products that ingredients are listed. And not only that, they're listed in order of concentration. So it is required by law. Okay, thank you. Robert Stacy. Thank you, uh, Dr. Levin. Um, enjoyed the, um, the presentation, very interesting. So my question is, uh, you came up with pricing for your B2B customers. Could you share with us how you developed it and validated it and, and what's been the response with initial uh, businesses that you have um, uh, listed at would be your B2B uh, partners? Absolutely. For my pricing structure, I relied heavily on our CRO, Brett Tyson, who currently is VP of sales for a large SaaS company. And, um, and in my initial presentations to online retailers, I've actually had people try to buy my company um, instead of have me of a service, but there's extreme interest. Thank you. Uh, next, John, you, uh, yeah, Robert is uh, asking, Kate, sorry, <laughs> Kathy Preeby. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Jackie. Good presentation. Uh, question on, uh, I understand the analysis, and I think that that would be um, a very valuable service. What I find a little troubling, and I'd like you to address, is the, the possibility of some kind of um, contamination with respect to your recommendations. In other words, if you have channel partners, they're actually paying to be a channel partner, and you're recommending them how does this, uh, how is this consistent with kind of a clean beauty, straightforward analysis? Absolutely. So the nice part about skin knowing is that our recommendations are truly personal. So we're not ever saying that one product or brand is bad for anybody. We're just saying it's a not right match for that particular person. If you look at our competition, actually, they are saying those things. And we feel like that is a big problem and conflict of interest. So we won't have that problem with skin knowing. Okay. Uh, David Freeman. Yeah. Hey, I, I enjoyed that. I mean, and I think what you're offering in the business model is cool. Um, but did I misunderstand the valuation at you wanted 1.65 million for 5%? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, as they say in Shark Tank, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Uh, thank you so much. I can comment on the valuation if everyone would like. You don't have to comment. Given what your revenues are and given where you are and how much you've invested personally and not getting any other institutional investors as an angel group, it's just way out of my, my league. Understood. Damien Howard? Yeah, I mean, with you collecting DNA information and, and other potentially sensitive information from customers, what have you looked at in terms of data privacy? Absolutely. So um, all of our encryption is um, HIPAA compliant. Um, so our developers are very familiar with dealing with medical information. So it's all stored in an encrypted fashion that's not related to a user's personal information. So anything that's identifying. But I guess the question still, are you collecting DNA? Oh, yes. No, good question. So we're not selling anyone's data um, at this point. It's truly considered private. Um, obviously, we would need to get permission to do that. And that's not our plan. OK, but how about, but how about actual DNA? How do you oh. get? Yes, uh, sorry about that. Okay, so we actually take raw data files um, that have DNA analysis in them. So people would come to our site, they would take their 23andMe analysis or Ancestry DNA analysis or any company that they've gotten DNA analysis from and they upload their actual file into our system. And then, and then we analyze for over 200 genes within that file. Okay, there's a question from Ron. Ron, you can you can raise your hand if uh, to, to do it. You can click on participate and then uh, partic participants, and then uh, you can click on raise hand. But let me ask uh, your question, Ron. He said, "What's the actual size of the market? The number of women who have conditions or who care about risk factors for cosmetics?" Absolutely. So that's one of the reasons why we're targeting um, millennials and Gen Z females. Their spending power is in the trillions. Um, so that's really important to us. We've also identified that there 24% of them spend over $100 per month on beauty and personal care products. 
And in a survey, they found that 80% of them um, want to know more about ingredients in their products and that they would switch to a clean beauty product um, over one that they're currently using if they had help finding one. So there's definite interest. Um, the time is up. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, D Damien, you had your chance. I'm going to let Howard ask the last question um, before we transition. Go ahead. All righty. Thank you. Um, who's your customer? Really? I mean, not, not the market, but who do you actually sell to other than online um, uh, online uh, 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 retailers of beauty uh, products. So you know, our, our, in, in other, who the real customer that is paying for this? Right. Um, so most of our site is actually free to the consumer for our business to business model and business to consumer model, excuse me. Um, we get paid mostly through affiliate links. So when people find products that are right for them, we give them a price comparison and then help them find um, who's selling it at the cheapest price. Um, and then we get affiliate commissions if that person purchases that product. Um, we also do offer a membership model where people can connect to experts and get product recommendations and actually personalized product recommendations from influencers and dermatologists. Um, but for the most part, we are free in making uh, revenue for, from our affiliate commissions. Uh, we do feel that our business to consumer model also supports the business to business model, which really will be our significant income area. All right. Thank you, Jackie, very much. Thank you. All right. Okay, so next we have uh, Mr. Wayne Record with Dara Circuit. All right, Wayne, whenever you're ready. All right, I'm uh, Wayne Rickard. I'm CEO of Terra Circuits. Um, I was seven years at Seagate Technology where I was chief technologist and uh, launched the consumer products division there. It's about a, a $2 billion division of Seagate today, 20% of their revenue. Uh, prior to that, I did a previous startup, Gadzoots Networks. We IPO'd in 99 and we returned a hundred times to our series seed investors. So that was a, a very fortunate deal for them and, and for us. Um, since 2009, I've been an angel investor myself uh, through Tech Coast Angels and also Desert Angels out of Tucson. Um, about two years ago, I met Dr. Jana Sheets, who's the founder of Terra Circuits. She has a PhD in physical chemistry from Stanford, and she's also an expert in microlithography and uh, organic electroluminescence, which is uh, more commonly known as OLED. It's the state of the art technology for high end televisions and displays. That's what you have on an iPhone today. Um, I was very impressed with the company and it's actually the first portfolio company that I've joined operationally as CEO. What Terra Circuits does is we actually make microassembly possible. Uh, microassembly is the building of electronic circuits and mechanical systems that are very small, super small on the nanometer or micrometer scale. Uh, we do that through a combination of proprietary polymers and also manufacturing methods and tools, which we've defined. And we have intellectual property covering every step of the process. So microassembly is excessively hard. Uh, and it's because the devices that require microassembly have lots of components and they're very tiny. An example would be a, uh, an Apple watch, which you see as the, the tear down on the left, uh, or it's basically a computer you wear on your wrist. And the, uh, the Echo Loop is uh, eff effectively an uh, Alexa smart speaker you wear on your finger. Uh, lower right hand corner, you see an x-ray machine that is ingestible. It's about the size of a vitamin and it's used for doing a colonoscopy that you, it travels through the body. Uh, no idea how they retrieve it. Um, but we can actually do any micro assembly challenge. We've chosen as our beachhead micro LED panel assembly. That's a display technology. And the reason we chose that will be pretty apparent. 
Uh, it's got some huge challenges. I'm sorry? Yeah, okay. So the display technology is cannibalized about every decade. Um, so here you see what happened about six years ago. You had 75% of the share was LCD. Uh, today, you see that LCD and OLED, about a 50-50 share, they're neck and neck with OLED consent continuing to take market share. If you're in the capital equipment business that, that builds the tools that are used to make displays, you're participating in an $8 billion market and all of that tooling transitions at the same time as these technology inflections. So if you're applied materials with a 30% market share, that's $2 billion of, of annual revenue that is at risk if you miss it. And we know that micro LED will be the next generation of display tech. Um, it's better in every measurable dimension than OLED and including it has the potential to be lower cost. So the big challenge with micro LED, which we also understand is that these devices are incredibly small, uh, smaller than a grain of pollen. Here's five micro LEDs on the head of an ant and handling these components is, is next to impossible with today's technology. Um, this is a pick and place machine and this is how components are assembled today. Uh, this is the speed of a high-end pick and place machine and a micro LED has 35 million of these tiny components. So to, to build a 4K 80 inch television would take 58 days with this technology. Um, obviously that does not scale up. Uh, what we need is a technology that can handle thousands of components simultaneously and place some accuracy. So that's what Terra Circuits does. Uh, we can pick up thousands of components and we can place them with submicron accuracy on a substrate and we have an exceedingly fast process that that's what's required to make it commercially viable. Um, competitively, the other approaches out there, are, they're either too expensive, uh, too slow, they have yield issues, or they, they leave residue on the, uh, the end product that uh, requires a subsequent cleaning step. Uh, we seconds. have none of these problems. And as, as far as the, the market, it's uh, very, very deep and rich. Uh, you're probably familiar with the OEM, Samsung, uh, Apple, and LG are some of the big OEM players. And at the other end of the, uh, of the food chain, you have the tool providers that I, I mentioned earlier, like Applied Materials, uh, also participating in this ecosystem. So we're projecting that we'll be cash flow positive in three years. Um, we have a, um, uh, a, we modeled this at a 55% contribution margin on polymer sales alone. So we've left out license fees and, and development contracts, which could also contribute to our revenue. Uh, the deal we're looking for is a $6 million deal. It's a $20 million pre-money valuation. Our seed round uh, is closed already. This round is just opening, and we're looking for a Series A investor uh, to lead and, and invest alongside one of our uh, uh, partners who will probably come from the industry. Uh, thank you, and I'll take questions. Katie Preeb is going to be our first questioner. Oh, hi, Wayne. Thanks. Uh, great presentation. What's involved in integrating this process into the existing manufacturing processes? Is that a setup question? That, that's a great question because uh, the, the beauty of our process is we leverage existing lithography equipment that's already in place. Uh, most of our competitors have developed brand new tooling. Uh, and the, uh, the number one cost of, if you look at what it would take to build an OLED display, for example, uh, the number one cost contribution is depreciation and amortization of the capital equipment. So the fact that we can leverage existing lithography tools uh, with very, uh, very little uh, upgrades is one of the big advantages of, of our approach. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Robert Stacy. Wayne, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, is who would be your um, partners, uh, targeted partners, and what would their expectations be uh, financially uh, in partnering with you? So we, we anticipate that the, uh, the partners will be initially, they'll, they'll be on both ends of the spectrum I showed you. They'll be tool providers who are, are anxious about preserving their, their position in the food chain uh, as capital equipment providers to the display manufacturers. At the other end, you have the display manufacturers themselves who see an opportunity to cut the tool providers out of the, uh, out of the loop by developing their own processes and their own tooling. Uh, and that, that's the category that Apple, for example, falls into. Uh, they'd, love to, they'd love to be vertically integrated. So we have opportunities at both ends, OEMs and tool providers, 
And then we also have an adjacent opportunity with uh, chemical providers who provide um, um, back end chemicals to the entire manufacturing ecosystem. So uh, our, our material could be used for other things and we'll probably partner with at least one chemical provider uh, to expand the market in that dimension. Is that a revenue share? That would be a revenue share, exactly. And initially we would be the uh, manufacturer and we would do a revenue share and they would be a distribution partner. Thank you. Howard Mirowitz is our next questioner. Hi, Wayne. Good, Good to see you again. Um, question is, um, how, um, how are you coming on the, uh, on the actual uh, construction of machines and do you have anything actually out in the market for test evaluation at this yes. point? And if so, okay, and I have a second follow-up question, okay. which is how much of your revenue is consumables versus, and how does that change over, over the forecast period? Okay, I'll answer the second one first. 100% of our, of our revenue is in the consumable space in the, in the initial planning that we've done. So we're not doing any, uh, I'm not accounting for any revenue share. Uh, I'm accounting only for material sales. Uh, the first question, how far are we along? Uh, we've actually built a, 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 a demo system in the lab that's capable of demonstrating the process. It's capable of uh, placing components with uh, sub two micron accuracy. Uh, we were awarded an NSF grant of uh, 256000 a couple months ago uh, to develop that even further. So that money's gone right into uh, refining that process. Uh, we, have, uh, we have shared the details of how to build that demo system with one large Korean display OEM. And we're in the process of actually uh, sending them material and then they send us uh, micro LEDs that are literally the size of a, a red blood cell. Uh, so we're working with that material and that process today. Uh, and we also are, are under evaluation at a, a, a chemical uh, provider that uh, would, would address the market that I mentioned earlier in the, in the uh, back end chemical materials space. So what, what is your, your market protection? This one of your earlier slides, I think said you had patents or something along those lines. What's the scope of that protection? We have uh, 11 granted patents that cover the process and the, uh, the most defensible patent uh, covers the entire category of materials that behave uh, with the, the manufacturing characteristics that we want. Uh, the specific formulation is a trade secret and we're working on refinements of that formulation as well. Uh, the, the original formulation and the trade, uh, it's a trade secret today could actually be patented as we develop uh, more advanced formulations that we move into the trade secret category. So we have lots of, uh, of, of protection in place and we also have other uh, IP that's, um, that, that we're uh, building uh, provisionals on today. Okay, Damien's gonna follow up, I'm guessing. All right, last, uh, yeah, last question. You're getting two IP attorneys back to back Asking you questions, Wayne. So okay. there you go. Go ahead, Damon. I was just wondering, does that protection extend to the countries that are most likely going to use this process? Yeah, uh, we have not yet applied for the uh, patent protection in uh, Korea and Japan, but that is uh, that is in our roadmap. So we are we are definitely going to be pursuing that. Uh, uh, Korea and Japan are the 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 two regions that that um, have the most overlap with this process. What about China and Taiwan? Don't they do a lot of the manufacturing? Yeah, Taiwan is is, uh, is definitely a uh, a candidate. Uh, China, not so much. Uh, uh, China is really not equipped to um, to 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 replicate this technology today. Uh, it's it's like you know the coming from the hard drive industry. China could never build a hard drive. This is very similar. You see hard drives being built in, in Japan and, and the US, uh, but uh, it's very difficult to duplicate some of the manufacturing techniques for things that are on this scale. All right, thanks Wayne, time is up, but uh, can you just uh, switch to your revenue a screen for me quickly? Sure. So you're gonna have a total revenue of about eight and a half million and then 
potentially, I guess, uh, an EBITDA of about four million. So you're saying uh, your pre-money valuation today is at twenty million. How could you justify that? So we're we're actually likely to get acquired be, before any of these numbers kick in, uh, based on the uh, the industry need for a solution like this and the fact that. Really, none of our, our competitors have been able to, uh, to demonstrate that, that they have a commercially viable solution. Uh, many of them have been able to, to actually build, build assemblies, but there's issues with, with scale up and with yield. Um, and there's enough interest in cornering the technology that eventually has a solution that we expect that in this time frame, there's gonna be a, a bit of a land grab for companies with strong IP. Okay. Thank you, Wayne, very much. Great presentation. At least I understood it this time. The first time you did this, I was like, <laughs> yeah, didn't <laughs> understand anything. So thank you again. Talk soon. Right. Thanks so much. Nice job, Wayne. <laughs> yeah. So literally first time he, he was presenting, I was like, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last presenter for the day, last but not least, is Worth Room. Please raise your hand. All right, here we go. All right, uh, whenever you're ready, you could um, share a screen and share, uh, start your video. There you go. Good afternoon. Can you see me okay, the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Well, my name is Dyson Worth. I'm the founder and sole investor of WorthRoom.com. It's a real estate network marketplace. And the first of its kind. And the problem is selling real estate is complicated and stressful for a lot of people. And it starts with the process of selling real estate. There's a million platforms to search for homes online, but not a single one of them actually complete a transaction, if you can believe that. And so here's the market, right? We got Zillow, Trulia, Redfin. I mean, it's just endless. And the core of the problem is the platform that realtors like me use which is the MLS and it's a database of listings, but it's not a marketplace where people can actually connect and transact real estate online. And so my mission is to condense and streamline home sales all in one place to make the transactions fast and simple. Um, so here we go. Uh, solution. So WorthRoom is your network marketplace to do real estate deals online. And uh, if you think about it, if you go on Zillow or if you go on Redfin, you're not actually buying the house online. Redfin's going to connect you with another realtor and they're going to do the transaction the old fashioned way through a series of emails and paperwork back and forth. And, uh, you know, Amazon and eBay are great examples of marketplaces today, but they're set up to sell simple products like toilet paper. My wife is on Amazon all day buying baby stuff, right? But real estate is a very complicated transaction and involves a lot of people. And so the current marketplaces that exist today aren't set up and designed to sell real estate online. Uh, so here's the product. Um, Basically, people create profiles like you would on Facebook or Instagram. Um, the only difference here is that we're building a marketplace around the network. So this is my house where I'm calling you from right now. And then you can see people actually make offers directly online. So that kind of sets us apart from every other website. You're not making offers online. You're making them privately through email and those contracts are being filled out manually. We're bringing automation uh, to the real estate transaction. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, uh, this is on the mobile, but you can see this is the offer template price financing contingencies. So these terms 
will auto fill the contracts. And if you have a realtor, the realtor can use this. If you want to do the offer yourself and save money and not use a realtor, you can do the offer yourself. I just believe in having an open marketplace where the tools are available to everyone. Right now, the tools and the offers and the contracts are really only available to professionals and licensed realtors. Consumers do not have access to uh, these professional tools. And so uh, by bringing everyone into one marketplace, we create competition, which is the whole purpose of a marketplace, right? I mean. I get top dollar when I sell my houses because I get multiple offers and I create a bidding war. And so here is an example of when you do offers online, the offers and the users who submit them are actually recorded online. So the people can actually see their competition. And that's what I believe in. I believe in competition. And to me, competition can accelerate the process Whereas, you know, if you're making an offer on a house and you have no idea what your competition is or how many offers there are you're competing against, you're probably going to offer lower because you don't know what's going on here. You can see your competition directly. And I've discovered that by displaying this information online, it can expedite uh, the negotiation process. Uh, uh, this is actually a real house, by the way. This is a house I just sold a seconds. few months ago. Um, and you can see here, this is the agent right here that uh, purchased the house right here. And we interviewed her and we asked her, you know, why did you come up in price? How did you get your buyer to offer us a million dollars? Well, she told us the buyer came online, saw the activity, saw all the offers, and she increased her offer very quickly, which our seller accepted. As far as the business model, we're not here to disrupt realtors. Every big tech is like obsessed with uh, disrupting realtors. I am a realtor. I don't want to disrupt my business. So I created a new one and we're just charging $1,000 uh, per transaction fee that occurs on the website. So if you're not making a deal online, it's free. There's only a cost to the buyer and seller if they actually transact, meaning they actually accept an offer online. Uh, this is the market, my market right here in Orange County. We do about 30 to 40,000 transactions a year. And, you know, I'm just starting here locally. Um, and my goal is to partner with another local brokerage. Uh, we're in talks with First Team, which is one of the largest brokerages in Southern California. They offered to buy the platform. I said, no, I'm not ready for that. Um, so it just wasn't the right fit, maybe, but I'm in talks with Suter, which is the largest uh, luxury broker here in Orange County. And those so just Dyson, I want to tell you, away. time is up. You're taking time from your Q&A. Okay, sorry about that. Happy to answer any questions. So Robert Stacy is going to be our first questioner. Thank you. Interesting presentation. So my question is, um, let's say I, I don't know you and other consumers don't know you. So... Can you uh, give us some color in terms of uh, your approach and the cost to attract these consumers and then scale it? Sure. Um, so for me, I'm just a professional real estate investor. I have a small brokerage um, where I just sell my own properties individually. Um, and that was the genesis of Worth Room was I bought a lot of foreclosures during the last recession and a lot of my clients and even me included appreciated the transparency of being able to submit bids online. The problem was the auction websites, uh, people don't like having their prices and their terms exposed online. So that's kind of the genesis of this. As far as customers go, um, this kind of right here is our traction. And so you can see this was the first house we sold and we earned a thousand bucks and we had about a thousand people come to the website and about a hundred of those people uh, created an account. And of those hundred people, about 11% uh, actually, um, you know, made offers on the, on the property. All right. So we have, we have a lot of people in the queue. So if you could limit your questions to one and be succinct in the, in the response as well, please. John Harbison is going to be our next questioner. 
Yeah, good presentation. Um, how do you deal with variability in forms, contracts, regulations across states and counties? Yeah, so that is a big problem. The market is very fragmented from state to state. That's why we're having the problem with the election, right? Because every, every state is different. Um, I think the market here in California is big enough, lucrative enough to start here. Um, the good thing is we use uh, what's called the California Purchase Agreement, which is a standard contract from the Association of Realtors. And our platform automates that contract, which all realtors in California use. Um, so we would be open to any realtor in California currently. Have I sold properties out of state? Sure. But it's not, we're not interested in going out of state until we've established a market here locally in uh, Southern California. Okay, uh, John, that was your question, right? Garrett Brown is our next questioner. Hey, Dyson. If uh, if that is your house, it looks like you're right around the corner from me here in the Lower Birds. Um, I have several questions. I'll just ask one, and then I'll go to the back of the line and re-raise my hand. But um, what's the plan for, for scaling this thing and getting customers quickly and getting customers in chunks? Yeah, so uh, we've had so much traffic. The site's crashed uh, a couple times. So my main problem has been developing the site. I'm not a tech person. Um, and so that's the, been the mostly the challenge is developing a product that people want to use and that works and doesn't crash, right? I mean, you can't have a website that crashes when you're trying to do a, a million dollar deal. How but many people did question, it take to I mean, crash it? Sorry? How many people were on it when it crashed? Uh, we had a couple of thousand people like log in all at once and we <laughs> just couldn't handle that kind of load is my understanding. And how did they and find then, you? Uh, Sorry? How did they find you? How did you get a couple? That's a, that's a gold mine, a couple thousand people at once. That's a good problem to have, but I'm just wondering how they found you. <laughs> Sales guy uh, they, asking. <laughs> it, well, they found me because, you know, we, we're realtors, right? We're going to post the listing on the MLS, which is what we all do. And then I just invite all the realtors and the consumers to transact online. And if they're not transacting online, right? I mean, only one person can buy my house. But a lot of them just come because they're curious. You know, they want to see how many offers we have. That information is valuable to buyers. And I think that information is valuable to potential sellers in the neighborhood too. Because if you're thinking about selling your house, you would probably want to know how many offers, you know, the, the neighbor down the street has. So most of it's been organic. Um, there's been no paid marketing of any kind. I, my, my number one challenge is developing the platform to a point where it's frictionless. I mean, that's the whole point of automation, right? Is making it simple and fast and frictionless. And so, yeah, I've been two years in development, beta testing the platform. It took me an entire year to streamline the offer process. Um, so this is no uh, easy task, right? If it was easy, it would have been done already. But my hope is to partner with the local brokerage, right? get in there. So I'm building it in house for the agents there. And just through them using it and their feedback, I can improve the software, I can show the amount of traffic and the customers and the and the value the platform provides to their sellers and their buyers. And to me, um, it's just getting in with the right brokerage partner to, to kick okay. the thing off. Damien's our next question. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Damien Howard. Time is up, so oh. um, you know, succinct, please. Yeah, I was just wondering, what's to stop Zillow from implementing this? Yeah, I, I, I guess their business model. Um, they've alienated realtors because they, they're a search engine, they're a database, they're not a marketplace, and so realtors like me, right? Like they they display our information on Zillow and then we have to pay them to recapture our customers online. So they're an advertising platform and a lead generation platform. They're not a marketplace platform. So to me, I guess anyone can copy anyone, but my business model is not an advertising lead generation model. It's a very simple marketplace model. And I feel that even though it might be simple anyone can replicate it, you know, we do have some trade secrets as far as how we automate the contracts. And I think our design is great. And, 
you know, anyone can right. copy a Picasso painting, right? But I don't Thanks, know. Thanks, Dyson. Uh, Dave, since this is the last one, uh, last but not least, you get the last question. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, brokers make only about 15%. So it's very difficult for a broker to take all these extra expenses on. Most of the money is made by the realtor itself. How do you uh, justify the cost for this when it's always applied just to the broker? Uh, the consumer is charged. So just like in a regular transaction, you would have an escrow fee, a title fee, a notary fee, right? All those closing charges are charged to the buyer and seller. And so our fee is charged to the consumer because it's the consumer that's actually benefiting the most, right? I'm selling your home online. The realtor is the user that's using the platform. So it's free to realtors. We're not um, infringing on realtor commissions. In fact, if we sell the home for top dollar online through a bidding war, like I've described, the, the realtor is going to get a higher commission because they're selling the home for more, right? So... So, but the platform Dyson. is free to realtors. We already pay enough advertising and it's just, just a big scam, so. Thanks Dyson. So we're gonna call that fee, Dyson fee or maybe a Worthroom fee, right? Just an additional fee. All right. <laughs> yeah, just a simple transaction much. fee, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, have a great one. Uh, thank you very much for presenting a great presentation. All right, so, um, just like we've been doing in the past few, uh, if you guys want to stick around for a little bit to discuss uh, the companies that uh, presented, uh, maybe 10 minutes or so uh, would be plenty of time probably. That would be great. If you can't, you're welcome to leave. So it, it's up to you. It's, a, it's an optional, uh, optional for anyone. Uh, for the presenters or anyone in the attendees, please leave so we can discuss you behind your back. I guess that's what it is. <laughs> Amy, you're leaving. Take care, Amy. <laughs> All right. So, thank attendees, you. thank you for leaving. Yeah. Take care. Hey, JJ. So, I, I have to head out too. So, it's a Oh, no problem. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Talk soon. Thank Talk you. Soon. Bye -bye. Whoever can stay, it'd be great. All right, Chris. JJ, have the presenters left? Uh, almost two, two, la two more. Okay, yeah. Oh, almost one more. Let, let me know, and I, I'd like to make the first comment. It's yours. <laughs> okay, JJ, great job. So my question is, is have we set an all-time record with valuation with uh, skin right. today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, 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 no. I have to tell you, <laughs> last week, there was an all-time record, 140 million. <laughs> yep, I was on that one. Uh, I got your beat. There was one that came to Tech Coast Angels on a pre-screening that was a billion. <laughs> no, what? <laughs> and, and the rationale was, I'm going to make a competitor to Uber. They're worth 10 billion, so I should be worth at least a billion. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's the they didn't get past the pre-screen. So uh, yeah, so to I told the guy last week, I said, I mean, you, they're, they're, they're all scientists. And then, and then there is a, they brought in a CFO from, it sounded like a PE firm. And then he said, oh, we're going to be at $63 a share. There's so many shares. It's worth <laughs> 140 million. So that's how they came up with that. So I was a little bit harsh on him, but uh, <laughs> that was it. All right. So just a little bit about, okay, let's see. Which company did you like most? Terra Circuits. Yeah, I think Terra Circuits. Terra Circuits. Terra Circuits. Terra Circuit, okay. I, I came out of semiconductors. I understand the problem. And as he was describing it, that's a big problem to fix. And what I also like is, is that he, he can sell to the tool manufacturers. He can also sell to the display manufacturers. Um, uh, Apple uh, would like to take him out. <laughs> Well, I, I understand that, but as I understand it, his revenue, uh, whatever revenue we have, is strictly based on consumables. It's strictly based on the polymer. Yeah. Or, or a license fee where he would get uh, revenue share. Right, but on the polymer. And I think 
Uh, and, I, you know, agreed. I like Terra Circus. The challenge, and I've seen this company for quite a while going through the screenings, is the, the transition from selling to a, a polymer to actually a device yes. or a process. Yes. And it, it looks like a materials company. Yeah, um, if I was an IP attorney, I would like to look at the patents. Um, and I would want to make sure that uh, he is in the, um, all of those uh, countries where the, we actually do the production. Yeah, so I mean, I'd like to look at the patents too. And I'm also, you know, if, if I remember correctly, I think it sounded like they hadn't filed yet internationally. No. He didn't file in Korea, he didn't file in Japan. Um, and well, he didn't file Japan Korea, he said. Production. Yeah. I think he filed in Korea, Japan, oh. and um, uh, one other country. He said he didn't. That's what he I said. Heard. He did not. <laughs> That's where he planned to file, and I'm concerned. Ah, I mean, okay. If if he said they already have ten patents, so if they accelerated that, then maybe they would have those and still have a chance to file internationally. But if they went through a standard process, I'm afraid that he may have missed the boat on filing internationally for a lot of those because there are time constraints. In the in the patent assignment database, there's only three applications that are in the United States. Two of them, um, Damien will understand this, have six million numbers on the patent number. And a, the patent publication number of the other one that wasn't registered is a 2013 publication date. Okay. So at least as All far right. as the assignment goes, they're really old IP. I, and I was gonna say, I think they came in through JANA, through the CTO yeah. as, as part of a, a prior employment or activity. Yes. Did not come in as part of Jana, Jana. Jana was with HP. What what's right. the feedback? On and other she actually invented a lot of this stuff at HP. But I believe I've seen them several times myself and I asked that question. Right. And they say they have complete rights from exclusive rights from HP worldwide. Um but that would have to be verified. Somebody knowledgeable would have to. Well, we did uh, uh, TCA, uh, John, uh, uh, Lisa, maybe you could help me. We did invest through the fund, right? I, I, I can't remember. I, I know we did. I, might, I think it, I'm not sure if it was through the fund or if it was before. Uh, Terra Circuits no, is I think the was, county fund. Yeah, we did. So yeah, so yes. we did invest. So the there was some, somebody did something and satisfied themselves that there's not an independent person. Most, out there most, li most likely Howard is because Wayne is a CEO. So there you go. All <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> That's it, a fair I, comment. He's in a different class than most of these other entrepreneurs yes, he is. that are yes, he is. depth and I, I agree with that. <laughs> you know, yeah. so many of these are you know i got an idea and i've never done this at all before but it's all going to work out the first time and obviously that's yep a high probability to occur I all right a, um just some go ahead bob can we switch topics a little bit Is i was just gonna else? say that go for it <laughs> Is there anything else that anybody actually liked like, yes that yeah. was my question <laughs> yeah i like the um uh the uh, um, what do you call it? Um, the fastener company, Thermalock. Enduralock. Yes. Enduralock. Enduralock. Uh, they okay. also, I, I've seen them also before and oh. rated them. Okay. I like them. Anybody as else? I, 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 I used to be an aerospace consultant and actually had a fastener company, so I know a lot about this segment. And um, there is a problem in that. There is definitely a value proposition of using proprietary fasteners that have a whole solution that reduce the engine. It's typically, you know, it's a dollar for the hole and twenty dollars for the fastener. You know, it, it it's for the fastening. And so, if you can have a proprietary one, that's for five dollars, and it takes two dollars, you, know, you save a lot of money. The problem is, is those companies are very siloed, and the engineers love it but the procurement people hate it because they want everything to be commodity so they can bang people up against each other and reduce the overall cost of the acquired things. And so it's a, it's a hard time doing what he's doing, at least in 
the big airspace companies that are on his target list. Um, I was going to say, I like that company as well, but my husband is president of an aerospace R&D company. <laughs> sure. And that is exactly their problem, that this is a big issue, but trying to get one of those primes to take a proprietary solution as far as off, instead of off the mark or off the shelf, it is really hard to do. If he gets in, it's fantastic. But until he does, it's, it's a brick wall. Well, I like them also. I feel, I feel the like the came up earlier was is that um, it's going to take a long time to get the um, uh, the socket, uh, like three years by the time you get through all the approvals and then the plane or helicopter goes into production. And you've got to convince them That's that it's long, for 40 fine. years. But, you know, so they say, what, you know, have you have any of these in the air for 40 years? Do we know that, the, you know, it stays? And that's that's usually a hard thing to do for a startup company. Yeah. The other question I have on them, I really like the guy. I think he like he has an understanding of what this is going to take and a willingness to be coached on how on things to do about it. But I'm gonna agree with you, Howard, on that one. Now he he was very um you know, he looked that he understands it really well. Yeah, I liked it. I just would, I, if I were in his shoes, knowing what I know, I would be pursuing a licensing approach as my only approach rather than trying to build okay. a competitor fastener company. It's just- Right. I, he, the reason they're building it is I think that it's coming out of a, another company that he already owns that already builds fasteners. So um, I think he has a, disposition to build something. But the other problem that he has, I think, is um, uh, is I don't know how much testing, I had a conversation with him about this, how much testing they have done on the, uh, the commonality or compatibility of these, of these fasteners under conditions of high material stress compared to existing fasteners. Not that they won't hold the thing together, but that something will pop loose because of aerodynamic loading at the location where the fastener actually is. And whether the way that these fasteners react to that is compatible with the way the existing solutions react to that. Because if it doesn't pass that kind of compatibility it'll never get um uh, adopted by anybody and there's also a repairability issue if, if, the, yeah. if you have a failure five years out yeah. and you have to start replacing these some fasteners are a lot easier to replace than others um yeah. and you may you may lose your wing while you're trying to take apart the fasteners that's interesting <laughs> All right, uh, maybe we'll switch to another one. Anyone liked all authenticate at all? I'm looking at the um, the aggregate scores compared to my scores, and I, I I have a little bit of bias on this one because I was actually in the identity access management space for five and a half years with my last company, and um, I I think that this company is solving a problem that doesn't exist. Um, I don't think anybody cares that they have to go to one place for their digital. <laughs> authentication and another place for their doors and cars. Um, and I also think that they're just, he, he, he seemed very naive about how bad Okta and OneLogin and all the other players in the space that I competed against for five and a half years um, are going to kick his ass. Yep. I was gonna say, okay. I work in this, uh, I have a number of clients in this space. It's really crowded. <laughs> I mean, he said he was, I, I don't remember what he said where he was on his, his filing or any protection but I'd be more interested if he's done a freedom to operate. Oh, there you go. I okay. would say he's gonna have a lot of challenges, especially with working with enterprise uh, clients, uh, given the, the, uh, the heterogeneous integration that's uh, in place today uh, with, I mean, you, you got Microsoft with like um, Active Directory Exchange, a lot of people are using a lot of different enterprise level authentication mechanism uh, for digital. Uh, and it's, it's, it's gonna, be costly for for him to kind of consolidate that space. Agreed. Okay, am I am I reading it correctly that he has the third highest score of the day? 
co uh, collectively? It's probably right, yeah, because he he had he had the, one of the highest scores coming into round two, so it still does. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that yeah, more reflects on the competition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, I, I wrote rated in zero on competition, but. <laughs> Okay. I could have. The brand. The, the, uh, uh, there's that, another. That. There's another issue with him, with his thing, which is, sure. I, and I can tell you about it because I, when I was with Mitsubishi, we bought a company in England called uh, Apricot Computers, which had a high security fob. This is many years ago, but anyway, their main customer that it was originally developed for was the British Defense Establishment. Okay. And basically, this was a micro-channel computer. Remember that? And um, and they it was a clone of a, a PS2, and um, the, the IBM micro-channel machine. And they had added hardware that the bus actually went through a decryptor. Okay. okay. And the, the 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 key to the decryptor was loaded from a fob to IR. And that was how they did it. So it was also a mixed hardware software solution. And um, the problem was when they went to, they said, oh, well, this is going to be great because IBM, the PS2 is going to be the new standard and we're going to be like the first phone out there. That was false. And but the other problem they had was they went to try to sell it to small business, like the guys trying to start with. After and it was people couldn't understand why why they even buy it i mean their small businesses don't have security problems that are so complex that they even need something like this so we, they ended up like completely the only people they could sell it to was big enterprises and the military okay. they we're never able and this guy thinks he can start Small enterprise, which I think is completely erroneous for this kind of thing. All right, uh, uh, Ron, you were saying something. I'm oh, sorry. Jimmy Howard was saying you don't build a you don't build a market lock by dealing with SMB. The, the, you know, you deal it with the Bank of America or Chase, you know, you know or Deutsche Telekom or market movers, market makers, but not with you know with with ten five million dollar a year uh, small businesses. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody like Gig X at all? This is the gig economy for white collar workers, executives, directors, or above. It's a. It's basically a. I guess a marketplace. Yeah. It was an idea. It was not yet a business, and they spent the whole presentation trying to prove to us that 80% of us will be gig workers in five years, which is not terribly credible. Um, and it was just an idea. There was nothing there. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? All right, uh, let's see. Uh, we talked about skin knowing very quickly. Terra Circuit, we're done with that. Um, uh, Enduralog, how about escapes? The, the VR for massage places. <laughs> I liked it, but um, in the era of COVID, they're going to have no revenues. Uh, <laughs> and, say, yeah, if they could you know, do that at home, home, they might and have something. They right? should focus strictly on spas and hotels uh, you know, as, as, as the way they can partner and gain customers. People seem to like it, but I, 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 I just question the current unit economics and the business model, but I like the solution and I like the appeal to you know, to to, to Gen Z uh, uh, women. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, if no one else, maybe we'll talk a bit about um, the 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 clothing that protects you. Uh, uh, iconic allure. Iconic allure. It was very interesting idea. I thought. Interesting. Yeah. I interesting. actually think he was like the, the, the second or third best for this group. But I think he is not very coachable. I got that's the impression I got. He's a you know he's a scientist. I think he's getting his PhD from Arizona or some. I I think he's based out of Arizona, 
and yeah, so I'm, I'm, you're uh, probably you're probably right. <laughs> I I didn't think he had anything there. He didn't really have, you know, he never tested anything to see if uh, I could spit on it. Maybe I could break it, you know. Hell, he'd never done anything. I, I, I was I, more interested in the wearability of that. I think that was one of the last questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It sounded yeah. like he was just putting a prototype to market. And right. this idea was supposed to be that you didn't know that you were wearing this. But if it's going to be that level of protection, I don't know how you have I don't know how breathability and movability and yeah. I, I got confused when you start talking about whether well, this mass shooting and this would prevent you from you yep. know, being in the mass shooting. I don't think people are feel that it's enough of a threat that every day I'm going to go out with bulletproof clothing on that I spend a thousand dollars for every outfit I I mean it just seems you know, people can be very worried about that, but I don't see them reinventing their wardrobe to be protected from that 100% of the time. Uh, that, that, that was potentially I, I probably I don't know the I'm thing. It's very <laughs> different than a policeman says, okay, I'm going to break in. I know they have guns right. on the other side. I'll wear my vest. Uh, or yeah. even a police oh, saying, I never know when I'm going to be a threat. But when you're yeah, talking right. about selling if it to you, individuals. If you lived in Mexico and you had money. Yeah. Or you lived in Ecuador and you had money, or you lived in Peru and you had money, you would buy them.